Good afternoon. Welcome to Assembly Natural Resources. Please take the roll. Assemblywoman Anderson. Present. Assemblywoman Bilbray Axelrod. Here. Assemblywoman Brown May. Here. Assemblywoman Considine. Present. Assemblyman DeLong. Present. Assemblywoman Duran. Here. Assemblyman Gurr. Here. Assemblywoman Hansen. Here. Assemblywoman LaRue Hatch. Here. Assemblyman Watts. Here. Assemblyman Urich. Here. Chair Cohen. I'm present. Uh, again, welcome everyone. Uh, we will have two bills today that we will take in order. Some housekeeping before we begin. Please silence all electronic devices. If you wish to testify, please sign in at the table by the door and provide a business card to the committee secretary. For those joining online, please be sure to mute your microphone when you're not speaking, thank you, to minimize any background noise. When testifying, please turn on the microphone and clearly state your name and affiliation, if any, for the, um, the record, then turn off the microphone each time you're done speaking. As for handouts, please provide 15 hard copies for members of the public. Electronic copies should have been submitted to our committee manager by 12 noon yes, uh, yesterday for members of the committee. Uh, we expect courtesy and respect in our interactions during the meeting, even if we don't agree with each other's positions. Committee members will be using our laptops to view handouts and other documents. Please don't view this as a sign of disrespect or inattention. We're just reviewing uh, exhibits and things like that on our laptops. Also, uh, once we are done with our bills, we will have public comment. Uh, as far as um, support, opposition, and public comment, that will be two minutes per person. Uh, so with that, I am going to open the hearing on Assembly Bill 97, which revises provisions relating to government administration, and welcome Assemblywoman Hardy and former Senator Hardy, and make the most of this that I can today, so please go ahead when you're ready. Thank you, Chair Cohen and members of the Natural Resources Committee. I'm Assemblywoman Melissa Hardy, and I represent Assembly District 22 in Clark County. I appreciate you um, hearing this bill today, and as mentioned, and we won't uh, belabor the point, but we, I just have to say I'm very honored to be here with a gentleman with a wonderful last name, and we will be here to do the Hardy and Hardy show. So <laughs> thank you again. Um, I introduced the bill at the request of the Air Conditioning, Heating, and Refrigeration Institute. The bill became necessary due to the passage of the American Innovation and Manufacturing Act by the United States Congress. The so-called AIM Act provides authority to the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, to regulate the production and consumption of hydrofluorocarbons, HFCs. HFCs are chemicals typically used as refrigerants, solvents, propellants, and fire suppressants, among other applications. The AIM Act specifically directs the EPA to phase down the supply of HFCs, which are harmful to the environment, and authorizes the EPA to restrict the use of HFCs as we transition to HFC substitutes, which are far better for the environment. Unfortunately, these HFC replacements are not per permitted under Nevada's codes. AB 97 is intended to address that problem. Here to explain the bill further and answer any questions you might have are Warren Hardy, and on the telephone we have Mike Narazi of the Air Conditioning, Heating, and Refrigeration Institute. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. It's good to be with you. Warren Hardy representing the Air Conditioning, Heating, and Refrigeration Institute. This is a bill, I'll have Mr. Narazi, if it pleases the chair, uh, uh, describe the, the, need, the need for it. Uh, but I did want to indicate a couple of things. I mean, this is an example of where good policy may get a, a little bit ahead of our state laws and our state uh, codes. Uh, I, most of you who know me well know that I prefer not to do these kinds of things in state law. We just simply don't have a choice on this in this instance, which Mike will explain. I also want to indicate you should have on Nellis a, an amendment from the Southern Nevada Water Authority which we consider a friendly amendment. We do not want to inadvertently, I, I did not know 
that water is considered a refrigerant and that this might jeopardize their uh, ordinances to, per to prohibit the use of, of, co of coolers. And we certainly don't want to interfere with that, uh, that ordinance. So uh, there is an amendment. I think the Southern Nevada Water Authority is here to speak to it, but we consider it a friendly amendment. Um, with that, Madam Chair, if it's okay, I'll, I'll turn a couple of minutes over to Mr. Nerozzi to, to uh, describe the legislation. Please go ahead, Mr. Nerozzi. Thanks, Warren. Good afternoon, Chair Cohen, Vice Chair Anderson, and members of the Natural Resource Committee. As he's, uh, Warren mentioned, my name is Mike Nerozzi. I'm the Director of Government Affairs the Air Conditioning, Heating, and Refrigeration Institute. It's a mouthful, but we typically just go by AHRI. Um, so thank you for allowing me to speak with you today and convey our strong support for Assembly Bill 97, sponsored by Assemblywoman Hardy, which includes language that's going to help provide our industry with the certainty needed to comply with for forthcoming federal regulations phasing down the use of HFCs and refrigerants. HRI represents 330 manufacturers of air conditioning, heating, and commercial refrigeration and water heating equipment. Our member companies, some of which operate factories or are headquartered here in Nevada, produce more than 90% of the residential and commercial air conditioning, heating, and commercial refrigeration equipment made in North America. We are also pleased to share with you that the HVAC R industry supports nearly 2,000 jobs in Nevada and more than 500, 571,000 jobs nationwide. As uh, <clears throat> the Assemblywoman and, and Warren had mentioned, the Federal uh, American Innovation Manufacturing Act is a federal act that's phasing down the use and the production and import of a class of chemicals known as hydrofluorocarbons or HFCs. Um, and they are primarily used in the applications that Warren had mentioned. Um, the US Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, is in the process of implementing the AIM Act in a way that will guide an orderly market consumer and environmentally friendly transition to a new range of substitute refrigerants. Hundreds of substitute refrigerants exist and are commercially available for all major uses of HFCs. U.S. manufacturers already are planning the transition to these new refrigerants, which are creating jobs, stimulating new investment, and positioning the U.S. to sustain its technological leadership in the HVAC-R industry across the world. The challenge our industry and U.S. consumers face is that many state building codes do not currently allow the use of certain substitute refrigerants, including in Nevada. AHRI and its member companies are working diligently to amend state building codes to allow these substitute refrigerants and avoid any marketplace disruptions as the EPA transition begins. To date, more than 20 states have adopted changes to their state building codes substantially similar to the language included in Assembly Bill 97, including in Arizona, Colorado, and Utah. Most other states, including New Mexico, are in the process of doing so either through legislation or regulatory action. By the end of this year, if not sooner, AHRI is expecting that all state building, all 50 state building code changes will be complete. The most important issue right now is time. New regulations proposed by the EPA will significantly restrict the upstream supply of HFCs beginning in 2024 and separately prohibit the use of certain HFCs in most new air conditioning and refrigeration product categories in 2025. As manufacturers start to transition product lines to these HFC substitutes, they need to know that they could sell the products with these HF substitutes in US markets, including in your state. The most significant barrier these manufacturers face to doing so is the state's building code. What Essentially, what AB 97 does is amend the state's building code to allow any HFC substitute that has already been approved by the EPA to be used in air conditioning and refrigeration equipment. If the change is not made this year, manufacturers will fa face significant risk of being unable to sell new air conditioning and refrigeration equipment into the state once the new EPA regulations take effect. AB 97 does not make any other change to state law. It simply removes a barrier to ensure Nevada consumers and businesses enjoy un uninterrupted access to HVAC-R equipment with the latest, most advanced, and most climate-friendly technologies. The climate benefits of the AIM Act implementation are considerable because many HFCs are thousands of more times powerful than the carbon dioxide that warming the planet. The transition from HFCs will reduce US greenhouse gas emissions by approximately 2.4 billion tons of carbon dioxide equivalent by the year 2036. Globally, the Federal AIM Act assures U.S. compliance with the Kigali Amendment to the Montreal Protocol, 
which phases down HFCs worldwide and avoids up to a 0.5 degrees Celsius of projected warring by 2100. Thank you again for the opportunity to present, present testimony at the hearing. HRI looks forward to continuing to work with the Nevada legislature to achieve both the economic and environmental benefits of the phase down HFCs. Thank you. Be happy to answer any questions, Madam Chair. Warren Hardy for the record. Thank you. I have a question from Assemblymember LaRue Hatch. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for your presentation. I just had a question um, in section one, and then I think repeating on the next page as well. It says that no city or county governmental entity can ban these alternatives. I just wondered, are there any current cities or counties that are banning these substitute? Thank you, ma thank you, Madam Chair. That's a that's a good question. I'll I'll allow uh, Mike to correct me if I'm wrong. We do have certain codes that do not permit these, which is the reason for us doing it legislatively, so we can in one one. Sw uh, fell swoop take away that I, I imagine I think it's pretty certain to say that as local governments update their codes they'll be they'll adopt these and it'll be won't be a problem but currently there are bans on the use of these high, these HFC uh, replacements uh, Mike Narosi AHRI uh, Warren is correct um, the, the main problem here is a timing issue between um, when states or localities update their building code and the mismatch between that and the federal transition that's going to be shrinking the supply of these, um, these HFC-based refrigerants. So we're not seeing, the problem is not that uh, municipalities or localities are trying to ban some of these new substitutes. We just need, the, the building code cycle is often you know, several additions behind the most recent version, which is 2024, uh, the 2024 ICC code, model codes. And typically, you know, I'm from the state of Pennsylvania. We just passed our 2018 model codes uh, last year. So there's a lag time between when the 2024 building codes, which contain this language and permit these substitutes, uh, would actually be in effect in local, in local governments in Nevada. Thank you for that, uh, Assembly Member. Yeah, Vice so Chair, go ahead. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I, so I'm not sure if this answer or this question is is really um, something that's from the bill language or more based upon uh, the answers that were just given. The supply chain are these are these items available, or is it going to cause like is everybody going to go out and rush and get the right things? I, because I know that we've got a supply chain issue in many other areas. I don't know necessarily if that's part of this bill. It's just something that, based upon the answers, made me connect some dots. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. That's a very good question uh, that the Vice Chair has. Um, uh, these, these things are still, the, the, the old technology, the old uh, uh, um, refrigerants are still in the pipeline and can be used, but the um, manufacturers of both the, the refrigerant and the equipment to run the refrigerant are rapidly, and, and Mike may answer that, I think they've discontinued and they're starting to go with the new technology. But that stuff will remain in the pipeline. People will still have access, still be able to use it. But as far as new construction is going, they're moving over to, to this, this new, uh, and, and I think that that uh, old, old refrigerant will be remain in the pipeline, the refrigerant itself for those who, who don't have the new equipment. So there's no requirement to replace the equipment under the federal law. We just have to make sure that as we go forward, this stuff's available. Mike Narosi, HRI. Um, Warren's 100% correct. The manufacturers of HVACR equipment um, were 100% ready to go uh, in terms of the supply of these new refrigerants. There's hundreds of these new uh, substitute refrigerants. Many of them are made by our manufacturers here in the United States. And so, we uh, do not anticipate any supply chain issues with the new refrigerants. Uh, we basically, as Warren mentioned, we're just going to be doing a gradual phase in. Our manufacturers will be gradually phasing in and incorporating these new refrigerants into existing equipment beginning, or into new equipment beginning next year. And to Warren's point, and I think others may have the same question, uh, it's, it's not mandating that you replace your existing equi equipment. It's just simply when you get to the end of life of your 
uh, say HVAC system in your home, uh, you will obviously install a new HVAC system that will have this refrigerant already in it. So the average consumer isn't gonna notice a difference in price. They're not gonna notice any supply chain disruptions. Um, this should be an orderly process provided we can uh, get the building codes updated and be able to sell the equipment. Okay, so just to be clear, I just wanna repeat what you said. So the average consumer isn't being required to change anything. It's just as the technology changes, as it's being phased out, um, when what they already have dies and they need to get something new, it will be replaced with with the new technology. Okay. Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Okay, Assemblymember Watts. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you all for the presentation. I, it's really helpful. I think uh, you know, when I first looked through the legislation, I was kind of wondering a little bit about the the language and the mechanism, and I think that uh, some of the information you provided was really helpful. Uh, having had some experience with building codes and uh, appliance standards myself, um, I, you know, I really appreciate the the fact that uh, building codes are adopted on a different cycle. Um, there's kind of three-year cycles, and even though the state adopts building codes, different local governments have different timelines to do that, and so. I was originally kind of wondering why are we why are we talking about kind of shall not adopt a building code, but then I, I see now this take any other action, and that actually really helps to allow the the local governments to update the building codes on their existing schedule. Because um, I was wondering well, why don't we just have them change the building codes? But that that could still take a lot of time. It sounds like what this does is make sure that this irons out those kind of supply chain issues and these timeline issues so that they can go ahead and go through their building code process on whatever timeline they have. But this will make sure that while they're going through that, as these products are coming to market, that there's no potential legal barrier to deploying them. So more of a comment, um, just to say I, I, I really appreciate um, the the way that this is structured um, to, to implement this and uh, and yeah, I hope my understanding of that is all correct. Thank you, Madam Chair. Warren Hardy for the record. 100% um, spot on. Well done, Assemblyman. <laughs> Mike Rosie, AHRI, I guess I would, I would just sum it all up by saying this is simply a bridge to get municipalities to until municipalities can adopt the 2024 building codes. It's simply just a bridge to prevent any type of disruption or prevent the, the sale of this equipment and these refrigerants um, in your state. Okay, and seeing no other questions, before we move on to support, do we have anyone from Southern Nevada Water Authority since, oh, okay, do you wanna come up since we're kind of using your friendly amendment? Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, uh, members of the committee. Chauncey Chowdhury on behalf of the Southern Nevada Water Authority. Yes, so uh, in terms of the amendment, you'll see that the changes are in section 7.1 and 7.2. Those are our amendments. So when we were reviewing this bill, we ha some of our folks had some concerns that uh, this bill would negate some of our local rules that we have on evaporative cooling. Um, the, the Southern Nevada Water Authority and its member agencies last year um, passed a moratorium on new evaporative cooling. So uh, the concern, was, and, and water is a type of class, class refrigerant classification. So the concern was this bill would uh, negate some of those uh, local rules that we've implemented. And uh, we spoke with the sponsor and we certainly appreciate them uh, working with us and uh, we appreciate them adopting our friendly amendment. All right, thank you for that. And so with that, uh, without any questions, we'll move into support. And then if you want to stay up in support or go ahead. 
Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Again, Chauncey Chowdong on behalf of the Southern Nevada Water Authority. Uh, Southern Nevada Water Authority serves 2.3 million residents in Southern Nevada and more than 50 million visitors annually. Um, again, we are in support of AB 97 with the proposed amendment. Um, the amendment keeps intact conservation efforts we've spearheaded at the local level. Um, and again, we were just concerned that the current version uh, would negate those provisions. Uh, we appreciate the sponsor working with us again and hope you approve the bill with the amendment. Thank you. Great, thank you. Anyone else in support, please come fill in the chairs. Go ahead when you're ready. Thank you, good afternoon, Chair. Members of the committee, for the record, David Cherry with the City of Henderson. I just wanted to also express the city's appreciation to the bill sponsor and to the Southern Nevada Water Authority for working together to create the amendment that will allow the preservation of the City of Henderson's recently enacted ordinance that has to deal with evaporative cooling. And we hope that you'll adopt the amended version of the, the bill as presented at today's hearing. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else in support? And if anyone else is in support, feel free to fill in the chairs. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Jeff Rogan, R-O-G-A-N, from Clark County. We are also in support of the amendment that's been proffered by SNWA um, for the reasons stated by Mr. Chowdong and the reasons set forth by the City of Henderson, and we urge you to adopt the amendment. Thank you very much. Thank you. Seeing no one else in support in Clark County. I don't see anyone in Las Vegas, but if anyone's there, please come up. I don't see anyone else. Okay. Seeing no one in Las Vegas. I don't see anyone in Elko, but if anyone's there, please come up. Okay, seeing none, BPS, if you can please go to the phone lines in support. To testify in support of Assembly Bill 97, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers wishing to provide testimony. Thank you. Okay, so we will move to opposition in Carson City. Seeing none, we'll move to opposition in Las Vegas. Seeing none, we'll move to opposition in Elko. Seeing none, we'll move to opposition on the phones, BPS. To testify in opposition of Assembly Bill 97, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers wishing to testify. Thank you. So we will move to neutral. Anyone in Carson City in neutral? Okay, seeing none, anyone in Las Vegas? Seeing none, anyone in Elko? Seeing none, if we could go to the phones, please. Testify in neutral to Assembly Bill 97. Please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers wishing to testify. Thank you, BPS. Okay, uh, then with that, I will ask the presenters if you'd like to make some closing remarks. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members of the committee, Warren Hardy. Um, you know, the wonderful thing about this business is we get to learn a lot about new stuff. A couple of sessions ago working for the Restaurant Association, I learned that gravy is not actually a beverage, <laughs> which, who knew? And now I learned that water is actually a refrigerant. So we're very grateful to, this, to the Water District for working with us. I, I'm rem I was remiss in my initial, co initial comments, not thinking... Assemblywoman, Har Assemblywoman Hardy for taking this on and working with us to get this passed and allowing the Hardy family to play just a small role in saving the world. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. With that, I will close out the hearing in AB 97. Uh, so I think what we're going to do is I know that um, Assemblywoman Gorlo, I believe, was in a chair's meeting for uh, the committee that she chairs uh, but I'm sure her staff is listening, so uh, we will take a short break before we hear Assembly Bill 162, and I'm sure she'll be here shortly. Well, right, we'll take a brief recess.
we're, we're going to come back to order. So we're going to uh, come back to order and we're going to move on to Assembly Bill 162. Assembly Bill 162 revises provisions governing restricted use pesticides containing certain chemicals, ones that I find very hard to say the name of. So uh, please, <laughs> please uh, go ahead, Assemblywoman. <laughs> Good afternoon, Chair Cohen and members of the Natural Resources Committee. Uh, for the record, I am Michelle Gorla. I represent Assembly District 35 in Clark County, and I'm pleased to be here today to present on Assembly Bill 162 for your consideration. With me today is Kelly Kelly, Executive Director of the Fallon Food Hub, Matt Forrester, Professor of Biology with the University of Reno, and via Zoom we have Drew Tower, excuse me, Tower with um, Beyond Pesticides. This bill, as amended, addresses the overuse of neonicotinoid pesticides by non-licensed, non-commercial users in cases where alternative pesticides would be just as effective. Negligent overuse of neonicotinoid pesticides has been associated with health problems in humans, and most importantly, a reduction in the population of pollinators, notably bees. I'll first provide some brief background information before I discuss the proposed amendment, then with the Chair's permission, turn it over to my co-presenters. Neonicotinoid pesticides first emerged in the 1990s and were marketed as a safe and environmentally friendly alternative to more traditional insecticides. They have been widely used in agriculture, landscaping, and veterinary medicine. While neonicotinoids have been praised for their effectiveness against pests, they have also been linked to significant harm to the environment and human health. One of the most concerning effects of neonicotinoids is their impact on bees and other pollinators. Neonicotinoids are systemic, meaning that they are absorbed by plants. When pollinators feed on contaminated plants, they can suffer from disorientation, impaired navigation, and reduced reproductive success. The loss of pollinators can have a cascading effect on ecosystems, leading to decline in plant populations, reduction in biodiversity, and negative impacts on food security. Neonicotinoids have also been linked to negative impacts on other non-target species, such as birds, fish, bats, and beneficial insects. And studies have shown that exposure to neonicotinoids can cause behavioral changes, reproductive failures, and mortality in these species. For example, per volume 163 of Science Direct, and I can't pronounce these either, Chair, um, <laughs> imidacloprid, close? Yeah. <laughs> and I've been working on this for over two years. Still can't pronounce it. But it um, impairs the echolocation system of bats by damaging vocal, auditory and spatial memory functions and causes flight orientation problems. Furthermore, neonicotinoids are known to persist in soil and water, leading to long-term environmental contamination. They can also accumulate in the food chain with potential risk to human health. Some neonicotinoids have been classified as potential carcinogens, while others are suspected of causing developmental and neurological disorders. Given the growing evidence of the harmful effects of neonicotinoids, it is important to limit their use on the landscape. Alternatives to neonicotinoids, such as integrated pest management practices, biological controls, and non-toxic insecticides can be effective in managing pests while minimizing harm to the environment and human health. In conclusion, neonicotinoid pesticides pose significant risks to the environment and human health. The use of these neonicotinoids should be minimized to protect uh, pollinators, non-target species, and long-term health of our ecosystem. Instead of discussing the bill as written, we're going to talk about the um, amendment that has been uploaded to Nellis, and each of you should have also received a copy in your inbox. The proposed amendment is a result of discussion with various industry stakeholders, such as it addresses concerns of agriculture, builders, veterinarians, and indoor pest control groups. The proposed amendment removes the provisions requiring neonicotinoids to be classified as a restricted use pesticide, along with the prohibition to apply them on state lands. Instead, it defines neonicotinoid pesticides and prohibits their sale or use on plats not grown for commercial agricultural purposes. In defining the pesticide, we also added two chemicals that we missed when originally drafting the bill. The proposed amendment also makes certain exceptions to this prohibition. Specifically, if you go to subsection 3 of section 1.3, excuse me, 1.5, of the proposed amendment, it lists the following products as permissible uses of neonicotinoids as long as they are used as specifically directed by the product label or instructions. Pet care, veterinary, personal care, 
and indoor pest control pesticides, outdoor products used around structures, provided that the product is not intended to be sprayed or applied on any plant, and wood preservative pesticides or pesticide treated wood products. I do want to bring to your attention that um, earlier today I had another conversation with a stakeholder and they let me know that insulation apparently also has neonicotinoids. So that would be an amendment to our amendment. The proposed amendment also defines commercial agricultural purposes in subsection four of section 1.5 as a cultivation of plants and or the use of farm and agricultural land for the purposes of obtaining through lawful means a monetary profit from cash income by producing an agricultural product. And lastly, I want you to note as amended section one to eight inclusive of this bill becomes effective upon passage and approval for the purpose of adopting any regulations and performing any other preparatory administrative tasks that are necessary to carry out the provision of this act. And on January 1st, 2024 for all other purposes. While there is, this is not the money committee, I want to point out that the fiscal note for the bill as originally written came back to zero from the State Department of Agriculture. In reviewing AB 162, the department decided that there would not be a significant added cost to them to enforce the proposed provisions. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to my co-presenters. Thank you, Assemblywoman Gorlow. Chair Cohen and members of Assembly Natural Resources, my name is Kelly Kelly, and I am the director of the Fallon Food Hub. That's spelled first name K-E-L-L-I, second name K-E-L-L-Y. The Fallon Food Hub is a nonprofit that works to support small to medium-sized agricultural producers in northern Nevada. We aggregate, sell, and distribute fresh fruits and vegetables that are raised right here in our communities and by our neighbors. The Nevada farmers that I work with grow a wide variety of produce, and they do it using all sorts of different methods. Some grow plants that are flood irrigated with surface water, some are dry farmed, and, are fed, and others are fed through drip irrigation. They grow plants conventionally, organically, and with no-till regenerative systems. There are many things that our Nevada produce, produce growers have differing opinions on, but the one thing that brings them all together is the importance of bees and other pollinators. Bees are keystone species. Those are species on which other, others in an ecosystem largely depend, organisms that help hold the system, the whole system together. Since 2018, beekeepers in the state of Nevada have reported the highest levels of bee colony collapse in the country, with 71% colony loss reported in 2019 and an additional 53% colony loss in 2020. Bees are among the most important pollinators of fresh fruits and vegetable plants, as well as silage field crops like alfalfa. In the United States, the economic value of pollination services provided by native insects alone is estimated at $3 billion annually. And at least one third of the world's crops and 90% of all plants require cross-pollination or self-pollination to spread and thrive. In Fallon, we really love our cantaloupes and whether or not you look forward to the yearly harvest of hearts of gold, uh, those cantaloupes along with apples, asparagus, broccoli, squash, tomatoes, cucumbers, and watermelons, just to name a few, grow and put out fruit thanks to bees. In order for these plants to pr produce the food items that we rely upon, pollen must be transferred from the male part of the flower to the female part of the flower. This work is completed by bees and other pollinating insects. In fact, bees are directly responsible for one in every three bites of food that humans consume. By some science-based and peer-reviewed accounts, the use of neonicotinoid pesticides is connected to triggering colony collapse disorder in beehives, including data that demonstrated that exposed hives had a 50% chance of surviving the winter after exposure. Currently, in the state of Nevada, a person is able to buy neonicotinoid pesticides for application to plants outside without even really knowing about the implications of that pesticide or the fact that it's an ingredient in the products that they're buying. The EPA allows consumer retail products to include neonicotinoids as an ingredient at rates 120 times higher than what is typically applied in a farm agricultural setting. Aside from a small bee hazard label, there is no requirement to communicate the harm that the inclusion of neonics as an ingredient causes to pollinators. They are added as ingredients to fertilizers and other products that aren't even marketed for the purpose of treatment of pest infestations. 
And when the treatment of pests is necessitated, there are a number of alternatives to the use of neonicotinoids that are effective and significantly less dangerous. In fact, a French study that was published in the National Library of Medicine, uh, this, this study was conducted before the country of France completely outlawed the outdoor application of neonicotinoids to plants. Uh, they found that in 96% of the 3,000 case, 3, case studies that were evaluated, that there was an effective alternative to neonicotinoids, and that was readily available. And in 78% of those cases, there was at least one non-chemical alternative method that could replace the neonic. As we were leaving this chamber after presenting to this body last week about healthy soils, I asked my friend, Farmer Joe Frey, about neonicotinoids. His words stuck with me. He said that after doing some research into neonics, he called his agronomist and said that he wanted to ensure that, there were, that neonics were 100% eliminated from any product that he used on his agricultural property. And I think that says just about everything that needs to be said. Neonics are a solution to a problem in which the solution is even more problematic than what it was created to fix. And with that, I'll turn it over to Matt Forrester, professor of insect ecology at UNR. There we go. Uh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be able to address uh, this uh, assembly. So my name is Matt Forrester. I'm an insect ecologist at the University of Nevada, Reno, where I've been since 2008. Um, among other things, my research group studies insects responding to modern stressors, including climate change and pesticides and habitat degradation. You may have heard the phrase insect apocalypse. Um, that's been used in the media. It's a rather extravagant phrase, but it reflects the fact that in various parts of the world, insects are now observed to be less abundant. Um, roughly one to 2% declines per year have been observed everywhere from Rome, Italy to pastures in Ohio. Uh, until recently, it was unknown what this meant for us, really, in the Inner Mountain West, because we have such vast open lands. Um, one thing that my lab has contributed is a study of butterflies across this region, and we study butterflies because we have data on them. They're easily observed, and one thing that we do is maintain the world's longest-running observational study of butterflies. There are, uh, there's a network of sites in California and Nevada, and some of them have been visited for more than 50 years every two weeks which is kind of a remarkable resource. We use that resource to understand what these insects are doing. And what we have discovered is that insects in the arid west have been declining at a rate of about 1.6% per year. So that's a compounded annual loss. It sounds like a small number, but you wouldn't be happy if your bank account was declining at that rate. Over the course of 20 years, that means that one mountain meadow that you could Imagine seeing a thousand butterflies flying around on a day 20 years ago now has about 725 butterflies, so about a 25% reduction, roughly speaking. That's quite dramatic, and it was a surprise to the scientific community that when we reported that for the open spaces of the West, uh, but it's not a mystery. We know what's going on. It's a three-pronged problem. It's climate change, habitat destruction, and habitat degradation. Those are all really challenging things that we all should be worried about, but the one that we can do the most for immediately is habitat degradation in the form of pesticide overuse and misuse and being used in places that we don't at all need to use them, which is what um, we're talking about here today. Uh, I am particularly uh, concerned with the overuse of neonicotinoids, or we can say neonics, which is a lot easier to say. Um, as we've heard, they're a problem because they're long-lasting in the environment, and they go systemic into plants. So you might think as a home gardener you're putting them only on leaves, but they migrate through the plant, and they end up in nectar and pollen. Uh, you might think that you're soaking the ground for root treatment, but again, they can end up in the nectar and the pollen and have really devastating effects on pollinators that are visiting uh, your yard. That systemic nature has encouraged kind of the abandonment of some smarter pesticide practices that, that existed a generation ago among home gardeners and in, in, in agriculture because we can be less discriminate now. You can just spray these very powerful poisons in your environment and they do an amazing job of 
taking care of the pests, but killing so many other things. And it is, as mentioned, having cascading effects up the ecosystem. We see declines in insectivorous birds in areas where insects are declining, which is most places we look these days. Um, you might wonder, why do we need to worry about this in Nevada? Because again, we have these vast open spaces. So I talk to the general public, and I often get this as a very perceptive question, like, okay, I understand I'm putting a poison in my yard that's maybe too powerful or it's more powerful than it needs to be, but I look out my window and I see these mountains in the, in the distance, right? Nevada has 200 plus mountain ranges. So does it matter what I do in my yard? It does matter because the main thing we've discovered in my lab is that climate change across the West is leading to reductions in insect density out in those open places. So there's an interesting sort of irony. The fact that climate change is having a pervasive impact in the open spaces elevates the importance of everything we do on the lands that are immediately under our control. So our yards, our city parks, our public lands can actually be really important habitat for pollinators upon which ecosystems depend. So we need to make smart choices about the lands that we manage and not just look to the mountains because the mountains are facing their own challenges from the mega droughts that we're experiencing. Not this year. Um, but that we are experiencing. Um, uh, so that's all, I, uh, that's all I have to say now, but I'd be happy to answer questions. Thank you. I think we have one more presenter on, the, on Zoom. If Drew could go ahead. Mr. Tower, sorry. Great. Sure, <laughs> certainly, certainly, thank you. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Chair Cohen and other esteemed members of the Nevada Assembly Committee on Natural Resources for the opportunity to speak. I am Drew Tower, uh, D-R-E-W-T-O-H-E-R. -E uh, I have a Master's of Science in Environmental Management from George Mason University, and I am the Community Resource and Policy Director at the National Nonprofit Beyond Pesticides. I am here representing our members and supporters uh, in Nevada, urging passage of a uh, AB 162 as amended. As DDT was to birds of prey, neonicotinoids are to pollinators. Neonicotinoids are potent systemic insecticides. They can be taken up by flowering plants and expressed in the pollen, nectar, and dew drops that pollinators feed upon. Even at low levels, studies show these chemicals impair foraging, uh, navigation, and learning behavior in bees, as well as suppress their immune system. Research shows that these chemicals increase a bee's susceptibility to mites, pathogens, and other diseases. Once common pollinators are declining at rapid rates, the Western monarch butterfly has declined by an astounding 99.9% .9 from 10 million butterflies in the 1980s to just under 2,000 in some recent counts. A study published last month identified neonic pesticides as the most impacting factor in the decline of the Western bumblebee, which is predicted to see population losses up to 97% over the next 30 years without intervention. These species are the bald eagles and osprey of our time. We know that the reason why we now see increasing populations of these animals are because we protected them from toxic pesticides when it was most needed. We also know that the consequences of inaction does not just harm pollinators, it hurts us as well. Emerging data show neonics can act as hormone disruptors, increasing risk of breast cancer. They can readily transfer from mother to fetus through the placenta, increasing risk of birth defects. They are associated with liver damage and neurological impacts like memory loss. The bill before you today would take an important step towards addressing these grave concerns. In light of inaction by the Environmental Protection Agency, the states of Maine and New Jersey have already enacted functionally similar legislation. And we do urge the committee to protect pollinators, public health, and the wider environment by passing AB 162 as amended. And I would be happy to take any questions from the committee. Thank you again. Thank you. We are open for questions. Okay, so so just so I've got this clear, so what we're talking about is the uh, neonics can still be used by farmers and professionals. It's just for household use. I couldn't go buy it and you know mix it up in a bucket in my backyard and and use it. Thank you, Chair Cohen. Yes, you are correct that agriculture and those that have um, training on how to use these products will still be able to use it. It's the general public who doesn't understand that you really shouldn't be applying this stuff in a, here's a glug glug in a bunch of water or in wind conditions that are 40, 50 miles an hour, even you know 10 and 20 can spread it in places that we really don't want it. So that's why we wanna keep it out of the hands of general public. 
Okay, and just for the, the sake of our uh, committee secretary, because we've got multiple presenters. I am so sorry. <laughs> so I'm Michelle Gorlo for the record. Thank you. And with that, I have a question from Vice Chair Anderson. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, my question, uh, my first question actually, the Chair took, which I'm so I'm happy that we've got that clarification. My other question though is from Section 12 of the bill and that has to do with um, when it actually becomes effective. Based upon the information that was presented, it sounds like there's some pretty serious dangerous things happening and the sooner we can get some of these things out of the system, the better. However, you have it starting in January of 2024. I'm just wondering why that date was utilized instead of July uh, based upon the growing seasons that we traditionally think of. Thank you so much for that question. It is a great one. And for the record, this is Assemblywoman Michelle Gorlo. And we opted to go for January 1st versus July just to help um, some of the supply that's already there get out. So we're helping those that already have it so they won't get stuck with it. Thank you. So um, just wondering if there's any, if they're with part of the, the process also of that longer time frame. If there's been any discussion at all about educating the public about why this will no longer be available or, or working with others as to why it should only be utilized in very specific regions or if there's been any discussion about that or if there are any plans to do so. For the record, Assemblywoman Michelle Gorlo, and that is a fabulous suggestion. We have not really talked about the education part of going out and making sure people understand what this product actually does, so we will work on that. Oh. Uh, for the record, this is Kelly Kelly, and I think that the stakeholder coalition that has been working with Assemblywoman Gorlo on this bill is very well positioned to uh, discuss with our, our communities the uh, harms from Neonex and why this legislation is being passed. In fact, uh, I think that a lot of that messaging has already started, and with the efforts by um, in both the city of Reno and Be Friendly City, and then also Carson City being a, a, a be friendly municipality, um, the, the word will spread quickly. Assemblyman DeLong. Thank you, Chair. Um, in my research on Neonix, um, I identified uh, another chemical, um, I think it's pronounced 910 Pyram, on the list of Neonix. I was wondering why it's not included. Thank you for the question. Assemblyman with Michelle Gorlo for the record, and I didn't know about it, so we can add that. <laughs> Matt Forrester for the record. But it's a neonic, and there's a lot of them. So I think we've written it to just, in, I mean, it is written to encompass neonics without limitation. Yeah, because it's Im impossible to keep track of them all, frankly. Yeah. Assembly Member Watts. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much for the presentation. I was just wondering, based on this uh, new amended language, can you talk about a, a little bit about how you expect kind of the um, the details of the implementation and enforcement uh, to go for this. I know that um, for some of the restricted use pesticides that is kind of um, regulated and run through the Department of Agriculture. So uh, if you could just speak to that, uh, that'd be great. Yeah, Kelly Kelly for the record. Uh, so our, our thought and approach with this legislation is to get neonicotinoids, I did so well until right now, to get neonics um, out of the commercial retail space. Um, so the, the agricultural pr producers that I spoke to about this legislation, I asked them, how do you get your pesticides? What, through what avenue are you acquiring them? And to a T, they all identified that they were working with agronomists and they were sourcing uh, any of their amendments through companies like Rocky Mountain Agronomics or um, Farm Supply. And so these were being purchased in larger quantities and at different uh, strengths and ratios than what is available in a commercial retail space. 
Uh, so there's already going to be an access point that is for larger quantities for folks who are applying these um, to, you know, whether to control an aphid infestation in alfalfa over hundreds of acres. They're not typically buying 32 ounce or one gallon containers. Um, so it, we're really looking at um, ideally industry self-regulation, um, removing access for the vast majority of, of uh, commercial consumers who don't really need a product that's as strong, as potent, and as harmful as neonicotinoids, and limiting that access for those commercial agricultural producers through their farm supply um, sources. And you know, if that proves to not be effective, if the industry isn't good at regulating, then we can circle back down the road. But for now, it, it seems like industry self-regulation is, is the way to go for a first step. Assemblymember Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for being here, and thank you for coming to see me today. Um, I appreciate the conversation, because I was in a panic that my Scots Whedon feed had these in it, and I did a little research, and the good news, Ortho got, quit using these products in 2017, I think it was, and Lowe's is not carrying any neonicnoids uh, since 2017, so it looks like hopefully maybe um, consumer retail is, is getting the word. I had a question in the article I'd read in uh, Chemical Engineering News, but it was from 2016. It said that the time the EPA was conducting a risk assessment of the pesticides and had temporarily stopped granting new permits for their use. So do we know, I, I mean, I, I'm feeling good about this legislation, but is it already kind of being taken care of on a federal level that will trickle down? Looks like Mr. Toller can answer that. Thank you. Yes, this is this is your Toller. Thank you, Chair. Um, EPA has announced that they are not registering any new neonicotinoid chemistries. Um, as far as their current review of the these chemicals, uh, they have been in perpetual review of the neonicotinoids for over a decade, and they have identified hazards to human health, pollinators, birds, aquatic wildlife. But the problem with this situation is that even when the agency identifies harm, it has not yet acted meaningfully to avert it. Uh, for example, in the agency's recent interim decision, uh, a final decision is not yet even on the agency's work plan. It identified uh, high risks to applicators uh, when, when applying neonicotinoids uh, to turf. Um, the agency's solution to this uh, is to propose label uh, language on the label advising homeowners not to use these products. And that is correct what you heard. Uh, they want the label of a product to say not to use it. Uh, EPA endorsed a product for sale. It does not believe it is safe for people to use. Uh, we, we have clear evidence uh, on the dangers of these chemicals, much of it uh, uh, developed by EPA. Uh, and we believe it is incumbent uh, on, on state lawmakers at this time uh, to finish the job that agents uh, that EPA appears to have no intention uh, of of doing, unfortunately. Thank you. Thank you. Assemblymember LaRue Hatch. Thank you, Chair. And thank you for speaking for the bees. I feel like the Lorax would be very proud today. Uh, so my question follows up a little bit on Assemblymember Watts and Assemblymember Hansen's of, I noticed that there is no enforcement agency listed or enforcement mechanisms. And so I just wondered, could you speak to Assemblywoman Hansen's assertion about the um, commercial vendors, right? Are these not on the shelves in Home Depot and Lowe's and everywhere else? Um, and if that is true, awesome, that's exciting. If it's not, what happens if those places have these on the shelves? Yeah, I can, I'll, I'll, Kelly Kelly for the record, I'll start and then I think I'll probably bounce it over to Drew for follow up. Um, but, you know, these large retailers, the, the, the big guys, the big box stores have their very well fleshed out organizations that have government affairs teams that follow policy changes. And so what we saw as happening in other states that had implemented neonicotinoid prohibitions, um, they are well aware of the changing laws and take action to ensure that um, that those chemicals are not in products that are sold within state. Now that being said, there there will be other products 
right? Like nature abhors a vacuum and there will be other pesticides that are available to control pest outbreaks for the, for the retail customer. Um, but it, our hope is that they'll be less dangerous and, and certainly will not include neonics. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. This is Drew uh, Tower. Uh, I can provide a little bit uh, more in addition to that. Uh, I would just note that, yeah, we have a situation where industry uh, is is getting ahead of many of the policies. Uh, and certainly that is a result of, of the science, um, as mentioned, and, and consumer pressure uh, around this as well. And I would note within the amended legislation that it does prohibit uh, a person to sell or deliver any neonicotinoid pesticide for the purpose of application of plants that are not grown for commercial purposes, except provided in the exemptions within subsection three. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Seeing no further questions, I'll ask you to step back and we're gonna move on to support. I'll remind uh, people that Support is you support the bill in its entirety with the amendment. Opposition is you support, I'm sorry, that you uh, oppose anything in the bill as amended. So even if you love the bill, but you just, there's a little something you wanna change about it with the amendment, you wanna add something, you have to come up in opposition, but please feel free to tell us that you love it in concept and just have couple little changes you want to work out and then neutral is you are not taking a position you're just providing us with information so with that we will start with support in Carson City please come forward and fill up the chairs Hi, Chair Cohn and members of the committee. My name is Barry Levinson, B-A-R-I-L-E-V-I-N-S-O-N. I'm a volunteer member of Sierra Club's Legislative Committee. I am also a medical doctor and I am a chemical engineer. On behalf of the club and our more than 30,000 members and supporters statewide, I'm speaking in support of AB 162. AB 162, with its amendment, bans all non-agricultural use of neonicotinoid pesticides. For the sake of our food supply, we must save our pollinators. Bees are essential for producing our fruits, vegetables, nuts, and seeds, the most healthful foods on the planet. These foods are packed with phytonutrients that are key in preventing many dreaded diseases, including diabetes, heart disease, autoimmune disease, and cancer. So it's very scary that our bee populations are in severe decline. In Nevada, we lost 53% of bee colonies in 2019 and 70% in 2018. The loss of bees in the world has been shown to cause over 500,000 deaths per year due to lack of healthful foods. There are many causative factors in the bee colony collapse, but a major cause is the use of these neonic pesticides. They are systemic, as you've heard, and they get into every part of the plant. So when bees drink the nectar, they get a dose of this neurotoxic pesticide, and which causes impaired navigation, impaired foraging, immune dysfunction, and directly can cause death. So neonics are water soluble, as you've also heard, and seep into our soils and waters, killing aquatic insects, fish, and amphibians. They kill birds when contaminated seeds are eaten. They have been found in 94% of white-tailed deer in Minnesota. Neonics have also been linked to human disease. They have been proven to transfer from a pregnant woman to her fetus and cause serious birth defects. They're causally linked to autism, memory loss, and breast cancer. The good news is that there are many safe alternatives to using neonicotinoid pesticides. If we switch to these safer methods, we could save the pollinators, save other animals, and improve human health. For these reasons, we urge you to support this bill. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, <clears throat> Chair Cohen and members of the committee. Uh, Ray Hopper, H-O-P-P-E-R, uh, with Help Save the Bees Foundation. I am a Vietnam veteran, a master beekeeper, and founder of Help Save the Bees Foundation. We want you to support AB 162. 
As amended, this bill seeks to remove neonicotinoid insecticides, that's neonics, from non-commercial ornamental use. While neonics are an important agricultural tool when used by trained, licensed, professional pesticide applicators, it is a threat to the environment in the hands of the consumer. Products containing neonics are readily available at home and garden stores where the product labels themselves state that it is highly toxic to bees and pollinators. The EPA knows that neonics kill bees and requires that, that notice on the label. And it's there in small print at the bottom, along with detailed instructions to time its use according to weather conditions to avoid runoff or wind drift. While we know that using pesticides and not adhering to the instructions is a federal offense, consumers pay little attention to that detail and will use it any way they like, probably on the weekend, whenever it's convenient. The label goes on to warn that runoff will kill aquatic invertebrates, but they don't tell you that it can stay in the soil for a long time. And the next time it rains, it will run off onto our, into our streams and tributaries. We remember the days of DDT, a most wonderfully effective insecticide. But once these toxins enter the food chain, they have far-reaching unintended consequences. We ask the Natural Resources Committee to endorse the amended AB 162 to keep these toxic chemicals off the shelves and out of the hands of consumers. Save the bees, save the environment, and save the earth. Thank you. Hello, my name is Melissa Gilbert, M-E-L-I-S-S-A-G-I-L-B-E-R-T. Thank you for um, allowing me to come and testify. So I run a campaign uh, called Be Friendly Reno, a little sticker here, uh, to help educate people on this issue. Um, I am in the process as a volunteer with Help Save the Bees Foundation to rebrand that statewide. So to answer your question earlier, we do have plans to help with the education once this is passed. Um, it's a difficult topic for me to talk about because I get so emotional about it. I don't personally have children, but I do this work for future generations. Um, in building the stakeholders, one of the things that I have done is reach out to golf courses, and I just have some really encouraging news for you guys about this. So talking to the uh, landscaping company that takes care of the Washoe County uh, golf course, uh, he said they have decided not to use neonics partly because it's uh, difficult to get registered and then you also have to have inspections by the EPA afterwards. So there already is this structure. And I, I believe he said, if I lived in Louisiana and was a groundskeeper for a golf course, I would have to worry about grubs. That is not something we're dealing with and in, in, in lawns do not need neonics. And for the sake of our future generations, being able to have healthy pollinators and agriculture, I urge you to vote yes on AB 162 as amended. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. And I'll ask the next group of three to fill in the chairs. Uh, and then as you're done, just um, vacate the chair and next person fill in. Thank you, Madam Chair. Patrick Donnelly with the Center for Biological Diversity. Uh, we are in support of the amended AB 162. Um, I want to sort of highlight uh, that some of the letters uh, that are posted on Nellis in opposition are from the original bill. The amended version has large exemptions for veterinary use. Um, for medication use and other types of uses that um, are not really the intent of this bill. So a number of the letters of opposition, the issues have been addressed through the amended version of this bill. I think also the sort of the big elephant in the room is agriculture is the, is the entity that uses the most neonics, and this bill will not touch agriculture. And I think that's very important to recognize that, you know, neonics play a role in the agricultural sector in this state, and the intent of this bill is not to touch that at all. And so um, I think it's a very narrow and tailored bill uh, to address a very specific issue without causing ancillary impacts on other sectors. Uh, so we would encourage you to support AB 162 and save the bees. Thank you. Hello, I'm Fauna Tomlinson, 
F A U N A T O M L I N S O N. I support AB 162 and hope you do too. Uh, why? Because fresh fruit is important to me. So, for the sake of fresh fruit and vegetables, uh, let's give bees a break. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Christy Cabrera Georgeson, C A B R E R A G E O R G E S O N. I'm the Deputy Director of the Nevada Conservation League here in support of AB 162. Um, as you've heard, neonics can have significant disruptions in our food supplies and cor collapse critical ecosystems. And for those reasons, we urge your support on the bill. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else in support in Carson City? Seeing none, I don't believe there's anyone in Elko or Las Vegas, but if you are there, please come forward. Okay, seeing none, BPS, if we can please uh, go to the phones. And I'll just remind the people on the phones, I, I didn't say it again before we started testimony, but I am timing people uh, to two minutes, so please keep your support comments to two minutes. To testify in support of Assembly Bill 162, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers wishing to testify. Thank you. Uh, so with that, we will go to opposition. And uh, for anyone in opposition in Carson City, please fill in the chairs and please go ahead when you're ready. Good evening, Madam Chair. Good to see you. For the record, Trey Abney, A-B-N-E-Y, with the abney Talkin Group here today representing the American Chemistry Council. Uh, Madam Chair, in trying to follow your rules, I'm going to term this a very friendly uh, opposition. Uh, in, in regards to uh, Assemblywoman Gorlow's amendment, you heard her mention a, a stakeholder that reached out to her that wanted to add structural uh, in, insulation uh, to the uh, to the exemptions, which I believe you'll find in Section 1.5, Sub 3. Uh, we have been working with her on that and appreciate that. But since it's not written in the amendment yet up here in opposition, uh, if that were added, we, it would move us to neutral. So I want to thank Assemblywoman Gorlow uh, for her time and, and help with this. Thank you. Thank you for letting us know. Please go ahead. For the record, I'm Doug Busselman, B-U-S-S-E-L-M-A-N. I'm the Executive Vice President of Nevada Farm Bureau. Farm Bureau policy opposes legislative proposal AB 162 as written. We have met with Assemblywoman Garlow and expressed our reasons for our opposition to the bill as it was written. Nevada farmers have a need for the types of insect control which these chemicals provide. We are aware of the proposed amendment that Assemblywoman Gorlow has provided, and we understand that the language of this amendment, through the, uh, the, the language, agricultural producers will not be affected by the proposed ban that the new language provides for sale or delivery of the identified chemicals. Although agricultural producers and other identified uh, as being covered in the permissible uses will be able to continue to use the products, we are uncertain what provisions in the law will provide for acquiring the products. I believe that it has been suggested that these products will be available to be purchased from wholesale providers, but that is not actually always the normal process for purchases. We would hope that by working with those advocating the amended version of AB 162, we would be able to make provisions for agricultural supply channels will be recognized and those systems would be maintained as they are now in process. I am certain that the others covered in sub four would also be able to purchase and resale the products that they use through the traditional channels as well. In my research of the two products that have been added to the list, and I can't pronounce uh, chemicals either, so I'm going to say number four and item number seven in the amended language. Um, in my research, neither of these are identified as being neonicotinoids and are technically in a different class of, of product than neonicotinoids. You can uh, Google that information for yourself and, and find out, like I did, um, that neither four nor the item seven are neonicotinoids. Actually, I found out that number four is actually used as a substitute for 
a neonicotinoid project that's on the, on the list. Our main reason for our opposition to the original language and somewhat is still a concern for the amended language, both the Federal Environmental Protection Agency and the Nevada Department of Agriculture have the authority to list these as all forms of restricted use pesticides. They go through a science-based process of determining whether there is a reason for such a listing. Mr. Busselman, we're, we're pretty far over two minutes and I'll, uh, so I'll just ask you to wrap up. Okay, well, again, we will go neutral if the, if the amendment is adopted and we would hope that those concerns about being able to be supplied will be addressed. Thank you and thank, thank you, you for staying in communication with the sponsor. Please go ahead. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Chairman and Board Members. Uh, for the record, my name is Steve Walker. I'm representing Eureka County. Eureka County is in opposition uh, as the Farm Bureau is, but uh, looks forward to the, uh, looks at the amendment as uh, mostly the solution. Uh, I think we still have the issue of how to access it. Uh, the chemicals for agricultural uses, uh, but again, I think we can work that out and we can move to a, a neutral or a uh, supporting position. Thank you. Anyone else in opposition in Carson City? Seeing none, anyone in Elko or Las Vegas? Seeing none, we'll go to the phones for opposition. To testify in opposition of Assembly Bill 162, please press star 9 now to take your place in the queue. Caller, you are unmuted and may begin. Hello, my name is Elliot King, E-L-L-I-O-T-T-K-I-N-G from Las Vegas, Nevada, for the record. I'm speaking on behalf of the National Association of Landscape Professionals in opposition of AB 162. Congress, through the passage of the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rod Rodenticide Act, as enforced by the EPA, has already spoken to how pesticides are to be evaluated, registered, and used in the United States. Together with the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, this two-tiered system approach to ensuring pesticides are used wisely in Nevada is highly effective. Under this two-tiered system, we currently have at any time either agency can promulgate changes to label discretions, restrict their use, or ban pesticides altogether. There's no need for intervention on the part of the legislature. Indeed, with legislature intervention and decisions that should be made by qualified scientists, unintended con consequences follow. As part of a periodic statutory review of all pesticides through the EPA, they are already reevaluating neonics not only under FIFRA, but under the requirements by the Endangered Species Act. At the conclusion of this, through the rigorous process, regulated uses of the neonics insecticides will be such that no endangered species of their critical habitat will be in jeopardy from this use. Pests persist regardless of politics. Absence of neonics, less effective, more toxic and antiquated pesticides must be employed to stem infestations after significant damage to landscapes have occurred. In 2020, the nation of Sri Lanka suddenly made the use of synthetic fertilizers and pesticides illegal in their country. Unsurprisingly, crop yields crashed with inflation soaring and availability of food warned. With AB 162 specifically excludes agricultural crops under Amendment 1, but what happened in Sri Lanka should serve as an object, an object lesson for what happens when politics attempt to substitute their opinions for the expert of scientists and regulators, the very people empowered by the legislature to make this determination. Using formulas for neonics such as neonics impregnated on fertilizers is a highly effective method of application that immediately places the Sir, product out of reach. Sir, two minutes. Quality. Can you please wrap up? We just follow in opposition of this bill and we look for further measures moving forward and we appreciate their support in the NALP's position. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, BPS next person in opposition. 
Chair, there are no more callers to testify. Thank you, BPS. With that, we'll go to neutral in Carson City. For the record, Ashley Jepson with the Nevada Department of Agriculture. I'm the administrator for our Plant Health and Compliance Division, and I have with me Brett Allen, um, who oversees our pesticide compliance program. Um, I want to provide just quickly some, some brief information on the programs that we administer with the Department of Agriculture under NRS 586 and 555. We do oversee the retail and distribution of all restricted-use pesticide retailers. Um, so that's a specific component of this as it's currently limited to restricted use pesticides. Um, we also oversee the registration of all pesticides that are used within the state of Nevada. Um, so this adds context to some of the concerns that we have in the enforcement end of this um, amendment as proposed. Uh, one of the things um, I want to note is the amendment that we do have before us would create a fiscal note. Um, the the original language that was proposed, we did say that there wasn't a fiscal note, but this was based on the assumption that we could still um, charge the fees that were in statute for all of those pesticides, being that we oversee the registration of all pesticides. So I just wanted to provide that as clarification. Um, and the, the fiscal note as it pertains to the amendment would be because it would add a new retail requirement um, for pretty much most big box stores as they are selling these products as it stands now. So we would actually have to go to all of these um, retailers of a lot of general use pesticides, confirm that they're verifying the end user, which is the big piece. This is imposing the requirement on um, how the product is used and making sure that they're, they're verifying that upon sale. Um, so with that, we would have to go in audit their records, make sure that they're verifying the end use of these products, how it's written. Um, so again, that's different than restricted use pesticides, which we oversee on the retail end now. Um, this is, uh, there's well over a thousand um, products uh, that are sold in Nevada with these ingredients, so that's a big um, determination on that. Uh, let's see. I think I covered my main points. Thank you. Thank you, and, and I'll just remind the committee that if there is a fiscal note that will be um, addressed if the, if the bill makes it out of committee in ways and means. So, all right, if, thank you. Question for the neutrals, can we um, Yeah, and yes, would you, uh, Ms. Jessup, would you uh, remain here? Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair, and, and thank you for bringing that forward that it's, it's a different process. Um, I kind of feel like I'm a broken record with the date of, of how it's supposed to be enacted. But with that new date, is that enough time for you to be able to come up with different policies and or procedures that might be necessary based upon the new information that you're bringing forward about um, the process of making sure that this is being followed correctly? Is this date still workable or is this something that you might need to talk with the maker of the, of the amendment? to verify that it's still something we could do. For the record, Ashley Jepson, Nevada Department of Agriculture. Um, I think we can reasonably come up with a process considering we kind of have some of that foundational language with RUPs. The, the bigger concern is the implementation and outreach to, to the retailers. It's a whole new process. They're not looking at end use. They're just selling what's on their shelf and expecting the user to you know, apply it appropriately, but if they're having to look and ask for how it's being used, that adds another element. Um, so it, it is a, a tight turnaround for sure. Um, so I, I think we need to converse more with industry too on what that would look like. Thank you, Ms. Jessup. Anyone else in neutral? Seeing none, anyone in Elko or Carson City? Okay, seeing none, BPS, anyone on the phone's in neutral? To provide neutral testimony for Assembly Bill 162, please press star nine now on your phone to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers to testify. Thank you, BPS. With that, I will invite the presenter back up. 
uh, to make any final comments. Thank you, Chair Cohen and members of the committee. I want to thank you again for hearing this on legislation, and we will continue to work with stakeholders. Thank you. And with that, I will close the hearing on AB 162 and move into public comment. Again, public comment will be limited to two minutes per person. And we will start with anyone for public comment in Carson City. Okay, seeing none, anyone in Elko or Las Vegas? Seeing none, anyone on the phones? To provide public comment, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers to provide public comment. Thank you, BPS. Anyone on the committee have anything? Okay, so with that, we are adjourned. Thank you, Chair.